Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times and our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. I'm grateful to introduce our guest preacher for today. I'm so excited that he's going to be sharing with us. He's a personal friend of mine. He's had a huge impact on the Kansas City area, and he's a friend of our congregation. Reverend Emmanuel, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Cleaver III is a graduate of Flanders Smith College, where he earned his bachelor's degree in political science. He is a graduate of Methodist Theological School in Ohio, where he earned his Master of Divinity degree. And he's a graduate of St. Paul School of Theology here in Kansas City, where he received, where he earned his Doctor of Ministry degree. He's pastored Centennial United Methodist Church here in Kansas City in the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District. There he renovated not only the building, but the congregation. It started a service on Saturday nights, hip-hop service, to reach the young people who were living in the community. Since 2008, he's been the senior pastor at St. James United Methodist Church, the 3,000-member congregation here in Kansas City, one of the leading churches in our city. He's a respected leader in our denomination. He's the author of the book Pastor on Track from Abingdon Press, and he's also a respected leader in the civic arena. When people want to get things done in Kansas City, they don't call his father the congressman, Emmanuel Cleaver II. They call the preacher, Emmanuel Cleaver III. Knowing that he has the voice of so many people in Kansas City in mind, he is able to speak into the issues that we're facing in our community. People listen when he speaks. He's a voice for justice, a voice for compassion in our city. He is soft-spoken, and I've often thought when I hear him speak of the advertisements for E.F. Hutton in the past. You know, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. That's how it is when, when Emmanuel Cleaver speaks. When he speaks, people listen. He is a Micah 6, 8 kind of Christian, one who seeks to do justice, loves mercy, and walks humbly with his God. Dr. Cleaver is married to his wife, Sharon. They have three children, two boys and one girl, Emmanuel IV and Isaac, and their daughter is Elena. I'm grateful and proud to call him my friend and co-laborer in Christ. In 2016, we met together over lunch, and we talked about what had happened in Ferguson, and we said, what can we do about this? How can we be involved in making our city look more like the kingdom of God? We began to talk about and dream about our congregations working together, and out of that was born Allies for Racial Justice, where our two churches work together, listen to each other, hear each other's stories, and work together, speaking up and standing up and working for justice. I'm very grateful for his leadership and his role in our congregation and in our community. And uh, Emmanuel, as you come, I want to I mention this. I asked Dr. Cleaver before he preaches if he would share something of his own personal experience. These last few weeks, we have been in the midst of conversations about race and racism and racial bias and, and the, the conversations around the police, and, and many of our members are in law enforcement. And I so appreciate you, and I'm very grateful for you, but I want us to be able to understand the questions and the concerns and the pain that's there. And I asked Dr. Cleaver if he would speak to that for just a moment before he moves into his sermon, if he would help us understand this sometimes rocky relationship between law enforcement and minority communities in our city and in our country. So I'm gonna invite you to listen. It's hard to listen sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to hear other people's truths, but this is how our lives are changed when we listen to other people's stories. And I'd like to invite you to listen carefully for God to speak to you through Dr. Cleaver today. Emmanuel, welcome to you. So glad you're here. Thank you so much, Pastor Adam, for the invitation. It's an honor and privilege to be here. And I want to begin uh, just by saying that I appreciate all that law enforcement does to keep our community safe. Uh, I have friends who are police officers. I used to live in a neighborhood full of police officers, so I understand a little bit of their struggle. But at the same time, there is a long history of tension between uh, minorities and the police department. In fact, modern day policing is traced back to the slave patrols during slavery. And what this group used to do, uh, mostly white men, would uh, track down runaway slaves, they would discipline them, and their job was to also to stop slave rebellions. And so after slavery, when police departments were being established in the minds of African Americans, this was just the old slave patrol. And so there has been this long tension, and I have experienced it personally. Uh, When Martin Luther King and John Lewis marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it wasn't the KKK that beat them, it was the police department. 
And when I've had my personal experiences here in Kansas City and in other states, my brother has had bad experiences with the police department and my friends, my father and grandfather, you, you just grow up with this mindset that you have to be careful. And so when a police officer is around, uh, th there's this fear that comes over you. And so the reason why there's so much protest, it's, it's more than just George Floyd. It's decades and decades of this tension. So much so that in Martin Luther King's most famous speech, I Have a Dream, he talked about dreaming of the day when there was no more police brutality in our communities. So some might ask, well, why, why are they fighting back? Why are they resisting arrest? Well, because we're afraid. We're, we're angry because this constantly happens. And so uh, when, when we're stopped or, or harassed by police, we, we don't know what to do. And sometimes we have this mentality, we either fight or we freeze. And a lot of times it's fight. It may not seem right to many of you, but when you're afraid, sometimes instincts kick in. And that's what all the protest is about. That's why I'm angry and, and more than angry, I'm afraid because I have two sons and I'm afraid that some of the experiences that I've had personally with police could happen to them. So there comes a point in the life of every young black man where your parents sit you down and tell you what to do when you're stopped by the police. Now we've all heard that, but when it happens, fear sometimes takes over. And I would argue that you would be hard pressed to find any black man in America that hasn't had a bad experience with the police. That's why we're protesting and that's why we welcome others to join our protest. But I believe the scripture for today might help us move forward from protest to progress. So would you please pray with me? Mighty God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for all that you are and all that you continue to do. Here and now, O oh Lord, I call upon you for preaching power. Touch me, anoint me, fill me completely with your spirit. Use me, Lord, that I might stand boldly on your word and declare your truth to your people for your name's sake. Holy Spirit, have your way in and through me. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 19, the first seven verses. 1 Samuel 19, first seven verses. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it says, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, take heed to yourself in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have been of good service to you. For he took his life in his hand and he slew the Philistine and the Lord wrought a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul hearkened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before." May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding, but most of all, the doing of this sacred and holy word. So I, I named the sermon, Time to Step Up, Time to Step Up. Now, when you hear the phrase, 
uh, time to step up, it really indicates that you have seen a need, that there's something wrong either in your personal life or something around you, and you see this need, and therefore you make up in your mind that I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to look for help. I'm not going to ask anyone else to do it in my place. I've made up in my mind that I am going to do something about it. I'm taking responsibility. Personally, I'm going to take responsibility, and with God's help, I'm going to step up and address this problem. Well, that's exactly what happened in our scripture today. Let's look at the whole story. Saul was Israel's first king, although Israel was not completely united. Saul was tall, he was handsome, he was strong. And and for a while, Saul walked in the ways of the Lord, but Saul got a big head. And he felt that he could do whatever he wanted to do. And so at that point, uh, Samuel would choose David, with God's guidance, to be Israel's next king. But in the meantime, Saul is ruler. And uh, the enemies of God's people were the Philistines. And one day in a battle... Uh, this giant of a Philistine by the name of Goliath. Some of you may be familiar with the story. He stepped forward and he challenged someone from Israel to take him on, but everyone was afraid, except a youngster by the name of David. David stepped up because he saw the need. He saw the need that there's this Philistine challenging God's army. So David stepped up and he would kill the giant Goliath. Well, after that, David was celebrated and King Saul would take David into his home. However, something happened that that Saul would become jealous of David and he wanted to do David harm. Well, Jonathan, Saul's son, found out about this and he told David, he told David to hide and I'm going to talk to my father on your behalf. In other words, let me say it this way, Jonathan steps up because he saw the need that Saul was going to kill an innocent man, someone that had helped to strengthen Israel as a nation. So Jonathan steps up, he talks to his father, and he talks his father out of killing young David. Well, after all of this, David would be brought back into King Saul's house. But I like the story because it clearly shows that when there's a need, someone has to be willing to step up and do something about it. So if you feel God leading you to step up, step one is you have to notice the wrong. Saul could have ignored what was happening. He could have said, that's David's problem. It has nothing to do with me. But Jonathan recognized the need and he said, even though it's not on me, I'm going to do something about it. When you see a need for change, you have to notice it and actually want to do something about it. And failure to do so will actually lead to more harm. When there's a need, when something in our society, in our world, that has to be changed because it does damage to individuals, when we ignore the problem, all it does is bring about more problems. So failure to act means trouble. Jonathan saw the need, he stepped up, and he did something about it. And, and, and the problem that he saw was it was the powerful, his father, King Saul, wanted to do harm to the powerless. Now, that's nothing new. All throughout world history, we see powerful individuals and and even corporations who do harm to those who are seemingly powerless. I mean, after all, there's nothing that young David could have done to Saul. Powerful against the powerless. It there's a history of abuse all around the world. And, and, it, and when we think about it, it, it digs into those isms. Uh, ageism, 
sexism, racism, classism. Those are instances where the powerful are doing harm to those who are seemingly powerless. And unless we have Jonathans willing to do something, it only brings about more harm. We need Jonathans. Now, if you're at home and you're saying to yourself, well, I think I might be a Jonathan, I need to warn you that Jonathans are willing to take risks. In fact, let me say that nothing significant in this world has ever changed without someone who was willing to take a risk. Change means risks. Jonathan took a risk by stepping to his father. After all, this was the man who raised him. After all, this was the most powerful person in Israel. So Jonathan took a risk by intervening on David's behalf. But I thank God, I thank God that there have been men and women throughout history like Jonathan who have been willing to take risks in order to bring about change. I think about Ella Baker during the 1950s and 60s, during the height of the civil rights movement in this country. Ella Baker was just as active as many of the men, but she noticed something. She noticed that there were only men in powerful positions, that all the women in the struggle seemed to be relegated to secretaries. So she actually stepped up and said to these leaders, we need more women in leadership positions. Now that was a risk because the men could have said, well, we really don't have time for that. We're dealing with something else. But because she stepped up, more women, it was a slow move, but more women eventually came to power. Nothing really changes in our world unless someone is willing to take a risk. I think of A. Philip Randolph in the 1920s and he worked for the railroad system and he noticed that blacks were treated as second class citizens. So he organized, he organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and, and through that union, he was able to fight for rights for those African-Americans working in the railroad for pay and for treatment. That was risky on his behalf because he, he could have been eliminated. He could have lost his job, but he was willing to take a risk in order to bring about change. There are so many others, someone like Thurgood Marshall, who served as the legal counsel for the National Advance uh, NAACP. And uh, he, one, his most famous case was Brown versus the Board of Education, Thurgood Marshall. And, and Brown versus the Board of Education challenged the thought of separate schools, but equal. Thurgood Marshall received death threats, yet he was willing to take that risk in order to bring about change. I want to give just one more, someone or two people actually who took risks to bring about change. I'm, I'm thinking of John and Charles Wesley, who were a part of the Church of England, but they saw that the church wasn't really reaching those who were considered lower class. So they started this movement. And they were ostracized by many of their peers in the Church of England. But because John and Charles Wesley saw the need and they took risks, as a result, years later, the Methodist Church would be born. I've said it already many times, and I want to say it again. Nothing significant ever changes unless someone is willing to step up and take risks. That's exactly what Jonathan does here in this story. But, but something really caught my attention about this story. So King Saul wanted to kill David. Jonathan steps in, patches things up, and then the story says that David moves back into the house of King Saul. The Message Bible says it like this, things went back to the way they were before. That's a sad reality. After all of that, things went back to the way they were. That David was living in the house of a man who wanted to kill him. David 
living in the house of a man who wanted to kill him. And, and I, could, I could relate to that story because ever since 1619, African-Americans, we have felt that we're living in a house of a nation that has been trying to kill us from the transatlantic slave trade where millions died to slavery in the Americas, and, and then Jim Crow and systemic racism. We have been in a house where it feels like the nation has been trying to kill us, but like David, David survived and we've survived because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of God's protection, because of God's love. But things went back to the way they were. And I'm thinking about all these protests that have been taking place all over the nation as a result of the killing of George Floyd. And it would be a sad state of affairs if after all of this, things went back to the way they were. So we have to decide as a nation, as followers of Christ, are we living in a moment or are we living in in a movement. Now there's a difference between a moment and a movement. A moment shakes things up, but only for a period of time, and then things go back. A movement shakes things up, and it shakes things up so much that things shift, and, and things begin to change. It's like the difference between a 360 and a 180. A 360 is when you turn completely around and you end up in the exact same position that you were in. Now, in doing a 360, you're shaking things up. You're doing something different, but you come back to the same spot. A 180, on the other hand, is you turn halfway, and that means you're moving in a different direction. So we need a movement, not a moment. We need a 180, not a 360. And the only way that happens is if we have some Jonathans who are willing to step up. Why as believers should we step up? Well, because we follow someone who stepped up on our behalf. Jesus saw that we were powerless against sin. We were powerless against death that we couldn't do anything about it. So Jesus was like Jonathan. He stepped up on our behalf and on the cross, he took on our sins and he took on death. And what Jesus did wasn't a moment, it was a movement. And because he was willing to step up, we went from hopeless to hopeful. We went from defeated to victorious. We went from weak to strength. And we went from life to death, all because Jesus stepped up. And so as his followers, it's our responsibility to step up when we see the need. So you might ask, how is it that you can step up? And I'm so glad you asked that question. Here, here's, here are some ways that you can step up. First, speak up when family or friends make racially insensitive comments. Don't let it slide to say something. All that does is just uh, build more hatred and more separation. So that's one thing you can, one way you can step up, say something. Jonathan saw a need and he said something. Here's another way that you can step up, to advocate for more diversity in corporate boardrooms. I recently read an article where it says that only 3.8% of African Americans are top level executives in Fortune 500 companies. I mean, that's a sad reality, 3.8% and 0.8% are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And, and, and I, I talked to uh, my uh, God brother who uh, share with me. Sometimes it's not all about race. It's simply about we uh, connect with people that we associate with. So if I know someone, then this person is promoted. And the reason why there are so few minorities in corporate boardrooms, because maybe executives don't know any minorities to hire. But that's a way that you can step up to advocate 
for more diversity in corporate boardrooms. Here's another way you can step up. Try to understand African-American culture by supporting black movies, TV shows, plays, and dance recitals. And, and reading black authors. You know, uh, I remember when the movie Black Panther came out and uh, black people were excited. I, I, but I heard some, some whites say that, uh, well, I, I'm not gonna go see this. This is an all black cast. And so maybe it's not for us. And, and I was confused by that because uh, I am a huge Lord of the Rings flat fan. I, I, I can go through the movie and quote it. Uh, the three Lord of the Rings movies and the three Hobbit movies. And uh, it is clear to see that there is not one, not one minority in any of those movies. Yet I watch it because it's good. So we, we have to be willing to watch those movies and support those plays that uh, may not be uh, as diverse, but African-Americans have been doing that for years. I grew up watching the Brady Bunch and never saw anybody that looked like me on the Brady Bunch. Here's another way that you can clearly step up and make a difference. Donate to civil rights groups, the United Negro College Fund, and organizations that promote cultural education. So few African-Americans have the opportunity to go to college simply because they cannot afford it. I, I think we're in a period right now where college is for either you're extremely poor or extremely rich. And so, so many people miss out on these opportunities. These are ways that you can actually step up like Jonathan. Jesus stepped up for you. Isn't it time for you to step up from others? Let's pray. Eternal God, we honor you. We thank you for the opportunity just to follow you. We thank you, O oh Lord, in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our grief, that you sent your son to step up on our behalf. And because he did, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Help us, O oh Lord, to see the need in our world, to see the need in our communities, and do something about it. And we know that with your help, we can accomplish all things. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.